But first, let's look to our Lord in prayer. Now, Father, we cling to the fact that you know the plans. You understand the ways. And you have your purposes. We're praying now that the church scattered throughout various settings is feeling a tremendous sense right now of comfort, strength, vigor. It comes to the working of the Holy Spirit in us, through us, among us. You know the needs that are here. All the various homes, all the various settings. And Father, what we're praying now is that you will come and meet at that point of need. For the one who's spiritually curious, it's tuned in now. I pray that you'll take that inquisitive spirit and begin to address the questions that have been developing within the minds of that person and wondering, where is God in the midst of all this? Take them to the foot of the cross. Ponder where God the Father was in the midst of that. And how he sent Jesus to die for our sins. Father, for those who love you, know you, want to grow in you. Take these words that are found here in your word. Apply them to our hearts. Warm these hearts. Engage these minds. Shape these wills. We've come here now, Father, once again. See Jesus. Him only. Pray these things again now in, in Jesus' name. Amen. Plans. I know the plans that I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans for welfare, not for evil. To give you a future and a hope. But our plans are not necessarily God's plans. And when you and I are thinking about the whole matter of plans, what I'd like to do is to think about three words, each of which begin with the letter F, that help us to put plans in proper perspective. First. In other words, whose plans come first? God's plans or our plans? When Jeremiah offered that perspective with regard to the plans of God, when he penned his thoughts in Jeremiah chapter 29, verse 11, when he said, for I know the plans I have for you, he was not talking about his plans for God. He was talking about God's plans for Jeremiah and for all those who were reading Jeremiah's words, who were exiled at that time. Which comes first? But along with the idea of plans and the question, which comes first, comes that second F, fluid. How do you take the plans of God, which come first, and apply them to fluid circumstances that you and I find ourselves in at this time? But then a third F, flexible. How do I take what comes first, God's plan, not mine, Apply them, his plan, to fluid situations you and I find ourselves in at this time. And then develop flexible strategies, flexible plans on our part to make the necessary adjustments to do what needs to be done to make a difference in the setting that God has placed us in. Adniram Judson had to grapple with that. He illustrates this. For you see, back in 1812, he was intending to make his way to India, Calcutta. And what he wanted to do was to share the gospel within that region, only to receive orders from the British government to leave the country at once and return to America. And so he and his missionary company, they retreated to an isle of France, wondering why, which a door seemed open at that point, had been so dramatically closed. They tried again. They made their way again to India. And then once more, they were ordered out of the country. 
And so, with heavy hearts, they landed in a setting known as Rangoon, which was the capital at that time of Burma, only to be placed in prison, treated poorly. And with these bonds of imprisonment, wondering what comes next. But he would find out later why God did what God did. While Judson was being held back from entering into India because God would have him be positioned in Burma, when he left the prisons of Burma, you see, it was the scars that he carried with him out of that imprisonment that caught the attention of various tribes people throughout Burma and was used by God to lead literally thousands to faith in Jesus Christ. God's plan came first. The fluid nature of the circumstances stood out. The flexible strategies in place. And he was able to say, no, I am not unused by God. I am to be used by God, which is the situation we find ourselves in now this morning. So what I want to do with you as we explore these verses together is to draw three significant priorities that we see here as to how to handle fluid times with a flexible approach. The first comes out of verse 23, down through verse 33, that in fluid times such as these, it's important now for you and me to be following the will of God to all settings. Like an Adoniram Judson. Like a Peter at this point. Now Peter has received a vision from the Lord, didn't he? And he had received a vision, and we noticed it last week. He was hungry. It was the noon hour. Probably wanted a little shawarma, something like that. Maybe a falafel. I know a place there in Joppa where he could go to a restaurant, the Gabe, pick something up. And all of a sudden, this sheet opens up, comes down from the heavens. It's descending. You and I are just told about it in verse 11. It's being led down by four corners upon the earth. And lo and behold, any kosher Jew would take a step back. In it were all kinds of animals and reptiles and birds of the air. And there came a voice to him, Rise, Peter, kill and eat. And you and I, you know Peter, I know Peter. And he says, Lord, I, I think I'll skip lunch. In fact, I think I'll start a Jewish fast. God's got other plans. Not once. Not twice. Uh, three times. Notice how God seems to work in triplicate with, with Peter. He challenges him to eat. Kill and eat. All this was prep, you see. During that noontime hour, God was speaking to him at his point of need. He was hungry, so God spoke in his hunger. Getting him to start rethinking his view of the way in which God would operate. And now he finds himself, the next day, getting up with some of the brothers from Joppa. And now they are making their way forward towards Caesarea. Caesarea. You're up to verse 24 at this point. And as they entered Caesarea, Cornelius, he's a centurion. He was expecting them and had called together his relatives and close friends. Now, Take a look, if you will, if you're looking on the screen and ponder what's in front of you. Maybe you're at your computer at this point. Notice the map. And notice how Peter is making his way roughly 30 miles or so northward. Making his way up the Mediterranean shoreline from Jaffa towards Caesarea. Caesarea. Look at the picture accompanying it. Very strategic harbor. A very strategic place. There were 3,000 Roman troops that were positioned in Caesarea. In fact, I remember standing in Caesarea and noticing an inscription to Pontius Pilate. It's found there. Pilate, tied to the Roman 
Empire. The inscriptions, the Colosseum, the harbor itself, dedicated to Caesar. That's why it's called Caesarea. Peter is making his way into increasing Gentile territory. How would that vision that God gave him relate to what he's about to experience? Well, you're up to the next verse. You're on your way now to verse 25. When Peter entered, notice this. Cornelius met him, fell down at his feet, and worshipped him. Why? Well, you've studied enough Roman mythology, let's say, back in your school days. And you know that not only in mythology, Roman mythology, where they the, were the mythological gods, but they were, they were also semi-gods, something less than. These were the semi-divine men. Is it possible that what we find here at this point is this one who is seeking God, on the other hand, has still got some of his pagan mythology shaping the way in which he will approach someone such as Peter? Well, now, what's Peter going to do? He's got good theology to confront Cornelius' mythology. And Peter lifted him up. Notice what he says to him. Stand up. I too am a man. And as he talked with him, he went in and found many persons gathered. What's happening at this point? What Peter has had to do is to make a series of adjustments. He's made his way out of Jerusalem. He's made his way to Jaffa. Holy Spirit's now leading him upward towards Caesarea. And now he is being given the opportunity to unlock the door, allowing for the gospel to penetrate the Gentile world. A pastor friend of mine penned these thoughts. I was out on a fishing boat in Michigan, Upper Peninsula, heading for a friend's cabin on the other side. Uh, but try as I might, I just, I just couldn't steer a straight course, he wrote. Because of the wind and the waves, I would stray a little off to the right or a little off to the left. I would swing the other way, but soon I'd have to correct the steering again. It's, well, if someone had traced the path of my boat, he would have seen a zigzag course across the water, yet one that continually moved toward the destination. People, life is a series of adjustments. Life is a continual process of getting used to things we hadn't expected nor previously experienced. Such as was the case for Peter. He's in front of a Gentile audience. A responsive audience. He's used to Jewish Christianity. Is he now prepared for Gentile Christianity? Where Jew and Gentile become one people before God? You're up to verse, verse 28. And he said to them, you yourselves know how unlawful it is for a Jew to associate with or visit anyone of another nation. Pause. Did you hit the pause button? Peter, where on earth is that in the Bible? I can't find it. Now, in Leviticus chapter 11, Leviticus chapter 11 talks about unclean foods, but it doesn't describe the whole matter of dissociate oneself with unclean people. Interestingly enough, two chapters later in Leviticus chapter 13, we're informed as to when and where you quarantine. It's a highly medical chapter. Now you tie all this together, and then furthermore, you ponder the situation that Peter found himself in, where he was standing with Jesus, and Jesus had been teaching 
then you also are without understanding. Do you not see that whatever goes into a person from outside cannot defile him? since it enters not his heart, but his stomach, and is expelled. Thus he declared all foods clean. Jesus had taught Peter that. But Jesus finds now, as he is at, his, at the right hand of the Father, as he's looked down upon Peter at this point, Peter seems to have extended the restrictions to include people, not merely foods. Now what's that going to do for the gospel? When Jesus had said, go into Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and then the uttermost parts of the earth. Peter's going to have to have his presuppositions about other people groups challenged. He's going to have to have his prejudices set aside. Have you set aside your prejudices to be part of the plan of God? This is what Peter is experiencing at this point. Now again, back to your F's. Which comes first? My plans or God's? Second F, fluidity. The circumstances right now are fluid, not fixed. Third, flexibility. Am I willing to be flexible in fluid times? Going back to first things, God's plan. In fluid times such as these, it's important to be following the will of God to all settings now. And look where Peter is at. He's not in his comfort zone, and maybe you are not either right now as, you are, as you're processing what's in front of you. And so here he is, and he's addressing these people, and he's acknowledging something about himself. You yourselves know how unlawful it is for a Jew to associate with or to visit anyone of another nation. You want to put your arm around Peter and say, not so, Peter. Expand your perspective. But God has shown me that I should not call any person common or unclean. Now you got it, Peter. So now you're up to verse 29. So when I was sent for, I came without objection. I ask then, why you sent for me? Now remember, as we studied last week, we're dealing with double vision. That just as Peter was receiving a vision, so was Cornelius. Cornelius is a centurion. Remember I said earlier, there were 3,000 troops in Caesarea. <coughs> and with these 3,000 troops, as a centurion, he was somebody who understood authority. Those under him and those above him. You'll notice that in the scripture, centurions are generally spoken of in high regard. In Luke chapter 7, for example, there was a centurion that was longing for Jesus to heal one of his servants. And as Jesus began to make his way to heal that servant, he was stopped along the way. And he was told he didn't have to come any further, just say the word and his servant would be healed. And Jesus was so taken with what the centurion had expressed. He marveled at him, turned to the crowd, followed him, and said, I tell you, not even in Israel have I found such faith. Can you imagine now how the faith of this centurion evangelistically impacted the mindset of the Jews around Jesus at that, that particular point in time. Case number two, there's a centurion at the cross of Jesus Christ. And Jesus has cried out, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. And having said this, he breathed his last. And now, what does Luke the physician tell us? What comes next? When the centurion saw what had taken place, he praised God, saying, certainly, this man was innocent. And now God is working. Makes you wonder then, what is being communicated among the centurions? Are they texting one another at this point, saying, you've got to take seriously who this Jesus is, you see. Well, no, it's Cornelius. And he says, four days ago, about this hour, I was praying in my house. Ninth hour. I can imagine Peter saying, you're praying? 
Gentile. Behold, a man stood before me in bright clothing and said, Cornelius, your prayer has been heard. Your arms have been remembered before God. Send therefore to Joppa, ask for Simon, who is called Peter. He's lodging in the house of Simon, a tanner by the sea. So I sent for you at once, and you have been kind enough to come. And now Peter is just, you don't see, he's melting. Now therefore, we're all here in the presence of God. Get this. And whether right now you are processing this teaching alone or with a gathering around you, notice what comes next. To hear all that you have been commanded by the Lord. Now Peter is saying to himself, this is the will of God. Changeless truths for changing times. This is fluid, not fixed. In fluid times such as these, it's important to be following the will of God to all settings. The nurse is inoculating me. I'm about to go to the Middle East and teach in various settings. The year is 2001. The date is 9-11. And as she's inoculating me, towers in New York are coming down. You sure you want to go, she says, as she's not crying? Everything changes. What was once considered fixed is now fluid. I began to receive information from around this, the country and outside the country. Change your plans. Please change your plans. Don't go. Well, that was resolved when the airports were temporarily closed. Fluid times. Not fixed times. God's plan. Not Highlander's plan. And when you begin to process this, you embrace what Jeremiah said, for I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans for welfare and not for evil, to give you a future and a hope. As now the centurion is ready to embrace the plan of salvation. Here then is the second priority. The first was following the will of God to all settings. The second is explaining the work of God among all people. And there's now Peter. And as Peter now is standing before this group of people, he opens his mouth. And as he opens his mouth, he begins with these words, truly, that's for emphasis. I understand that God shows no partiality. In other words, now, the wall separating the Jew and the Gentile is crumbling but in every nation, anyone who fears him and does what is right is acceptable to him. And so what, is, what does he say now at this point? Begin to notice the linear approach that he takes of drawing these people into the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. And he does it by riveting their attention upon Jesus. Verse 36 is where you're at. And as for the word that he sent to Israel, preaching the good news of peace through Jesus Christ, you see, he's Lord of all. You yourselves know what happened throughout all Judea. The information's out, you know. It's all over the newscasts. Beginning from Galilee, and now notice he deals, first of all, with the forerunner, John the Baptist. After the baptism that John proclaimed, and wasn't it a Herod that oversaw the death of John the Baptist? This would have been knowledge in Roman circles. How God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and with power. And he went about doing good in healing all who were oppressed by the devil, for God was with him. 
And now you can imagine as they lean forward, because this man, he's got first-hand involvement in all this. We're witnesses, Greek word martyrs, of all that he did, both in the country of the Jews and in Jerusalem. Now, connect the dots. Will you do that at this point? They put him to death by hanging him on a tree, but connect 39 to 40, but God raised him on the third day and made him to appear. Hit the pause button at that point. When you and I see the death of Jesus Christ and the resurrection of Jesus Christ tied together, I want you to think about the whole idea of the hinges on a door. That both hinges have to be in place for the door to function as it should. In other words, to put it this way, the resurrection assures what Calvary secures. Good Friday and Easter Sunday morning, they're meant to be connected to one another, not separated from one another. Peter's making the connections. So are they mentally, even more so spiritually, you're up to verse 41. Not to all the people, but to us who have been chosen by God as witnesses. And there you have it again. Isn't he talking about this whole idea of them being willing to be martyrs if necessary? Who ate and drank with him after he, for re-emphasis, rose from the dead. And now what you see here is the centurion saying, Jesus Christ is victor over death. Now, maybe Peter led them in one of Mercy Me's songs, like the best news ever. What do you think? Some say don't give up and hope that your good is good enough. Head down, keep on working. If you can earn it, you deserve it. Some say push on through. After all, it's the least that you can do. But don't buy what they're selling. It couldn't be further from the truth. Get this now. What if I were the one to tell you that the fight's already been won? Well, I think your day is about to get better. What if I were the one to tell you that the work's already been done? It's not good news. It's the best news ever. And now the centurion, he's... he's Listening to mercy me. He gets it. You don't see him nodding his head at this point. The battle is won. Three days later, Jesus Christ rose from the dead. He's victor. And Roman soldiers understand something about victory. And so then there's Peter. To him all the prophets bear witness that everyone who believes in him receives forgiveness of sins through his name. Do you know Jesus Christ as your Lord? As his Savior? There's salvation found in no one else. Through no other name. But the name of Jesus, you see. Now what you've done at this point is that you've connected the will of God to the work of God, didn't you? Because in verse 23 to 33, you're talking about following the will of God to all settings. And verse 34 through 43, you're explaining the work of God among all people. But there is one more priority I want to draw out for you. It's found in verse 44 through 48. It involves discerning the ways of God in all circumstances. Peter is still speaking. He was still saying these things. He was explaining the gospel. Get this. God interrupts his gospel presentation. Now, how do you like that? The Holy Spirit fell on all who heard the word. Be discerning of the interruptions that God produces. The interruptions from God are invitations by God for people to be exposed to the gospel that God is sharing. While Peter was still saying these things, the Holy Spirit on all who heard the word. Read on. 
And the believers from among the circumcised who had come with Peter were amazed. Why? Because they're finding out now the Holy Spirit was not merely meant for the Jews. Gentiles as well. Jew and Gentile meant to be pulled together as one people in Christ. They were speaking, and as they were speaking, what we find here now in verse 46 is that the entourage of Peter were hearing them speaking in tongues. These had to be known tongues because the entourage of Peter would be able to say that they were extolling God. God is broken in. God's interrupted. And what God is doing at this point is that he's tearing down walls and uniting people, not politically, but spiritually, through the gospel of Jesus Christ. For those that have traveled to New England, or people like me who have lived in New England, always value the writing of Robert Frost from Vermont. Now, if you're driving up and down the streets of towns in New England, you're going to notice that all the neighbors' properties are divided by stone walls. He's got a poem that he wrote, Mending Walls. Something there is that doesn't love a wall, that sends the frozen ground swell under it, spills the upper boulders in the sun goes on to say, at spring mending time, we find them there. In other words, the stones have fallen off somewhat of the walls, and they've got to be put back into place. I let my neighbor know beyond the hill, and on a day we meet to walk the line and set the wall between us once again to keep the wall between us. And he begins to wonder if there ought to be walls between people. But his neighbor says, good fences make good neighbors. Springs the mischief in me, and I wonder if I could put a notion in his head. Why do they make good neighbors? Do we need walls that separate us? But then Frost ends with the fact that his friend says, Good fences make good neighbors. But Frost adds, there's something in a wall that makes it want to bring it down. Now what God is doing at this point is that he's tearing down walls. He's unifying people. And now as the Holy Spirit had come upon the people in Jerusalem and they had been speaking in tongues, Acts 2, and then for verification of the Holy Spirit's work, the people in Samaria through the ministry of Philip accepted the gospel of Jesus Christ and began speaking in tongues, verifying again the movement, Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria. Now, the third verification, and Peter's got to be saying, God is still working in triplicate for me. Here I am in Caesarea, household of Gentiles, and now they begin to communicate in a way in which it's understandable, extolling God. He takes a deep breath. We've come full circle. Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, end of the earth. Verification, verification, verification. And so, of course, he pulls, can anyone withhold water for baptizing these people who just received the Holy Spirit just as we have? And he commanded them to be baptized. Where? How? In the name of God of Jesus Christ. And then they asked him to remain for some days. And there's Peter hanging out with some Gentiles who love Jesus as their Lord and as their Savior. Hey, connect through social media, through other means, with those who don't know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. Build relationships, tear down walls, 
and allow for oneness to be experienced. And when you wonder why you're going through what you're going through, follow the will of God to all settings. Explain the work of God among all people. Discern the ways of God in all circumstances. When it all is said and done, you're going to be able to fully embrace what Jeremiah himself had penned. For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans for welfare, not for evil, to give you a future and a hope. Let's close in prayer. So, Father, we're thanking you now for your word. Here we see the quantum leap from the Jewish population to the Gentile population. Transition point of Samaria being validated each step along the way for Peter, of all people, to be able to see first ten and then bring back to Jerusalem the good news of how Gentiles had likewise put faith and trust in Jesus. So, Father, we see the strategic plan unfolding. We might not see at this moment how this medical situation globally fits into your plan. But we know, we know that you know what you're doing. Your plans, not ours. Your plans are first. Our circumstances are fluid. Our strategies are flexible. We want to be in alignment with your will for your glory. And we'll give you all the praise. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you.